normal range, but on the low end, but potentially with the vials thick or not good quality, uh -huh. which could be causing the fat malabsorption yeah. problems. Do you effects. take bitters? Are you familiar with bitters? I don't take bitters. I do take the HCL after uh -huh. the meal, and then the, I take um, Similase with each meal. Uh -huh. I've tried the PCT, like some fat mm -hmm. type enzymes. It's not changed anything. Orally, the BCT? Or injected? Orally. Yeah, there's, an, there's another form that might work better too. We're going to talk about actually a lot of things you mentioned too. TCP, there's some yeah. digestive enzymes. How, there's also ox bile, which is a little I've different. Tried that that one doesn't help. At all. Yeah. yeah. And I've tried these over the course of like six months, not like, oh. Like, oh, I just tried it the day. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about some of the things you mentioned, but at the end, let's come back mm -hmm. to it, because I think it's really nice, too, to have case studies, mm -hmm. if you're willing. Mm -hmm. um, and sometimes, like, so my training, again, was a little bit more conventional, and so I'm going to focus a little bit more on some of the supplements and things. So, uh, sometimes what Rachel and I say overlaps, and sometimes she also has, you know, a totally different view viewpoint, like the bitters, I think, is a really helpful. Um, but again, because our training is different, we're trying to give you a little bit of a broader base of information. So, um, okay, so I started the video. So if people are coming on late, that's fine. Um, but I just wanted to mention that last week we really talked about what causes leaky gut, what it is, and then some, some resources. So let me share the screen so that the video is not on us and people are looking at the slides when they come on. And... Perfect. Yeah. And then, um, so one of my favorite books, and this is okay even if you don't have celiac disease, is called Celiac Disease by Peter Green. He also talks a lot about why gliadin is inflammatory. Gliadin is the protein that we break gluten down into when we digest gluten. So a lot, of, we, we talked a little bit about gluten last week. It is often a trigger for people for inflammation, but not 100% of people need to be gluten-free. Um, the other thing that I say to people is sometimes my patients, when they go to Italy or France, they can eat their gluten. So obviously we've done something to our gluten, and I think we know what those things are. That's also what we talked about last week was like um, pesticides, GMOs, um, the plastics, the heavy metals, the air pollution, all the things that our filters working, our liver is working on filtering out. And um, I like this book because it also talks about non-celiac gluten sensitivity, which can be a complicated conversation. And he makes it pretty simple. And then I also briefly touched on this, but this was at the very end. So I just want to repeat that um, food allergy testing can be really expensive and really unreliable. Years ago, I started doing it with LabCorp using IgE and IgG testing with LabCorp, and they'll test a lot of things, and people were coming back. Everybody was allergic to white rice, and I was like, what? <laughs> and I don't think they were actually allergic to white rice. There was a little bit of cross-reactivity. It was a too-sensitive test, which can be dangerous, because if I hand this to a patient and they see they can't eat these 80 things, they're going to freak out, and it's going to feel very restricting, right? Um, yeah. So yeah. Nowadays, I'm using a Dunwoody food allergy panel. Dunwoody is the only lab I would recommend doing food allergy testing with. It's not as, as expensive as the others, um, which is kind of nice, but it is $299. And we did one on a patient last week, and um, tuna came back positive and peanuts. And those were two things she'd still been eating she didn't realize, um, but those were her two biggest. You now, the test, how many products does it test against? Um, so the $299 includes 88, but you can change it up if you wanted to pay a little bit more, if you're eating more than 88 things. Um, you know, mainstays. Most people are, but does it, is it just strictly food or is it like toxins as well? Metals? You can, you, toxins and metals, I use doctor's data for that with a urine test because that's more accurate and less expensive. However, with the food allergens, you can add spices and things too. That's, the spices tend to be, you know, once you get into spices, there's so many and some people are adding a spice that they don't realize they're reacting to too. Um, I think the, yeah, so the, it's just that the pricing goes up a little bit. But honestly, 
a lot of people that come in to see me have already stripped it down to less than 88 things because they're so paranoid about eating anything really because they're having so much indigestion and pain. Um, the reason I like the Dunwoody Labs is because there's something called IgG4, which is an aspect of our immune system that actually blocks an IgE response. So if you're having an acute reaction, like you eat peanuts and you immediately get a rash around your mouth, we know you're, you're allergic. However, if you're eating something and you're not getting a response until a few days later, it can be because it's being partially blocked by another part of your immune system that's actually trying to help you. And I get that, those numbers with the done one panel. So maybe you're having an IgE reaction, but IgG4 is blocking it. I can actually see that on your results. And we can talk about what that means. Is it blocking it enough or do you need to lay off of this food for a, a few months? What I used to say to people was, well, once that comes back positive, like with the lab core testing, gluten's positive, you should never have gluten again. Well, I've actually found in the last few years that's not true. Lots of people can heal and they will heal. And like for me, for example, eggs were an issue. So I didn't have eggs for about a year. Now I can have eggs once a week. I can't have eggs three meals a day. Like maybe I did when I was pregnant. I probably overdid it, you know, seven years ago. But now I can have eggs again. So um, I do see people heal, which is really rewarding because I do not like doing these tests and telling people they have to take it out forever. Um, but really elimination is often the best test because sometimes it's really stressful to spend money on food allergy testing and we're trying to lower our stress level so we can digest our food. <laughs> we talked a little bit about that last week too and I know Rachel will probably mention that too but if we drive while we eat we're probably not going to digest very well. If we eat and then we have a fight with our boyfriend we're probably not going to digest very well you know. Um, Okay, the other thing is look at your poop. So I talk a lot more about poop with people than I think a lot of providers, conventional providers do. Um, and I ask my kids constantly, you know, what did it look like? Was there undigested food in your stool? That's a really big clue. Was it C or S shaped like Dr. Oz likes to say? Or was it hard rabbit pellets? That's not good, right? Was it, was it really loose? Was there blood? Was there mucus? Was there undigested fat? It's important that we know these things. Um, I won't harp too much on the herbs because I, I, you know, Rachel's going to be, this is her specialty, but um, sometimes candida and funguses that look like candida can live in our gut for many years. And so what can you do to get rid of them? It's not it's not going to be a one day, you know, one pill process with candida or with other funguses. However, it is definitely possible to get rid of them. Sometimes something that works for someone else is not going to work for you. And that's why I think it is nice to work with a provider. I've recently actually started incorporating kinesiology where I do muscle testing because there might be 2000 supplements that will actually get rid of candida, but how do I know which one's going to work for you? And now that I've gotten better at doing muscle testing on myself, I think I can help you learn how to do it. Um, but it, it feels a little woo woo in the beginning. So you have to trust the, the process a little bit. Um, you know, black walnut, wormwood, oregano oil, grapefruit seed extract, clove oil. These are all on Dr. Axe's website. Josh Axe is a good resource. Um, he's an acupuncturist. And then I also, we sometimes add caprylic acid, podarco. Um, conventional treatments would be nystatin, diflucan. Nystatin and diflucan act very differently. And Dr. Hamid was gonna hop on, but he's not on yet, I don't think. He's a compounding pharmacist that I work with. And he's the first one that taught me because we didn't really learn too much about the mechanism of action. Well, I shouldn't say that. In school, we learned a lot about mechanism of action of conventional drugs, but it was such a fast course that we didn't get into too much detail. Um, nystatin that we give babies for thrush is often in sucrose, it's in sugar, and that can make the thrush a lot worse. So little tricks that the compounding pharmacists know are really helpful because we actually don't wanna take more sugar when we're trying to kill yeast or candida or, or any fungus. Um, and then, of course, you know, diflucan or fluconazole, and if Dr. Me was on, he could correct me if I was wrong about this, does a better job of, of an intraconazole too, does a better job of killing the spores or not actively getting to the, the fungus that's hidden that either has a biofilm around it or just hasn't sprouted a, a spore yet, really. Um, so it's nice to, to know when it's appropriate to use conventional drugs, when it's appropriate to use herbs and supplements. And that's why I think sometimes it's important to sort of have your team of people you can ask questions to and um, you only get your health, right? I mean, what does it matter 
all these other things are probably less important than how healthy we are and how we feel. So I think a lot of what I do also is try to just help people realize their priorities and their what's going on in their life is really important that we and, and that we can get them healthy, give people some hope too. Um, bone broth is often really helpful. Um, especially, you know, for people that like to drink alcohol, I find that having some bone broth at the end of the night or the next morning, I think really helps heal those tight jun junctions in the gut. And then you can sort of reset everything. And I'll let Rachel talk about Kachari. Um, so when we're, when we're working on gut healing, see, these are some things I give people. Sometimes we start with butyric acid, but again, using more muscle testing helps people save money because if I'm sitting with you and I think that, that, um, glutamine would be a good idea, I can muscle test and we can decide if that's actually a good idea. Um, glutamine or L-glutamine or glutamate, digestive enzymes with every meal, probiotics, which I'm going to talk about, I'm going to come back to in just a minute. Um, quercetin, phosphatidylserine. And this morning, I was actually thinking of a few more that have been helpful, especially for gallbladder. Ox bile. Biotogen is a new prebiotic that I've started having people that need prebiotic take with their probiotic. Um, I think it's one of the best Pro prebiotics out there, but there's also potato starch is actually pretty cheap and you can actually make potato starch yourself and use that as a prebiotic. The bottom line though is that our good bacteria in our gut actually needs food to eat in order to grow and flourish. And if we're not eating fiber because it makes us gassy or belchy or feel really funky, we're not actually feeding the good bacteria. And it may not be that we did anything really bad. Maybe we haven't even had antibiotics in 20 years, but we're exposed to hand sanitizers and pesticides. And our world has been set up to actually kill our good gut flora. So we have to work pretty hard sometimes to bring it back. Um, and then of course, trying to rule out certain important things like SIBO, doing testing for that, ruling out H. pylori, which we can test for easily. H. pylori is one of the most common bacteria that causes reflux. Um, and I talked last week a little bit about gut dysbiosis and just what that means that there can be an imbalance of good versus bad. Um, and then aloe can be pretty helpful for gut healing. And sometimes ALA, alpha lipoic acid, or other chelating agents can be helpful for gut healing. If we're harboring heavy metals in our gut, it is very hard to heal gut. Um, sometimes really concentrated lemon water will help kick out a gallbladder stone, but you have to do it every day for a couple months. So I'm talking like squeeze two lemons in a cup of water, so not just a little bit of lemon, and every morning before you do anything else. Um, but there are definitely, there's, there's this connection, right? And I think actually that the picture may be coming too. With the lemon water? Yeah. In addition to it being the first thing you drink, should you wait to consume something else or does it not matter as long as it's first? I think it's better to wait a little bit, kind of like the celery juice because you're boosting the, the, well, with the lemon water, you're trying to open up that common bile duct and just get things to flow. Mm -hmm. So in my opinion, waiting at least 30 minutes would be good. Minutes cool. But kind of like with everything, if you can't wait, does that mean you shouldn't do it? Probably not. It's kind of like with herbs. Yeah, it would be great to take everything on herbs in yeah. between meals on an empty stomach. But if it's a question of do it and take it with food or don't do it at all, then let's just do what works yeah. for you and then we can reassess in a few weeks. What about, this is maybe a silly question, but mm -hmm. like is the effect of this going to go down if I make it the night before and it's something I can just grab out of the fridge? For lemon water, that's a good question. Um, I'd have to research that. I'm not sure. I think that one thing though is that you want it to be warm. Yeah. Um, you don't want it to be cold, so mm -hmm. yeah. then you would have to heat it. So room temperature then... is fine or you want it to be like I mean, room, it depends on if it's winter and it's going to be cold, then, you know, yeah, you really yeah. want it to be like, kind of like similar to your body. Yeah. Um, uh -huh. So that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So warm. And then if you squeeze it the night ahead and then you heat it up, then you are changing the properties mm -hmm. of the lemon. Mm -hmm. okay. So my dad was actually on a proton pump inhibitor for many, many, many years to reduce stomach acid until he started reading on his own because there's no way I'm going to convince him of anything about, <laughs> about what acid reflux is. And he actually started just not drinking ice water. That's the only thing he changed and he didn't need his stomach mask. So I think that goes to show that like we do things that are counterintuitive, especially from an Ayurvedic perspective. They don't make sense. And Definitely. And I mean, that's the thing too, is that like I say here that the, um, the digestive fire is squelched by cool, damp things. So if you're drinking a lot of cold, 
you know, if you're drinking a lot of water all day, but it's ice water, it's going to have a negative effect because yeah. your gut does not want cold. Cold yeah, is like, shocks the body. Yeah, it's just, and it's really, that's not... Mm -hmm what you want to do. Now the flip side of that is like, maybe we'll do our adrenal thyroid workshop again. Mitch, our wellness coach actually te teaches people how to do cold immersion to reset their adrenal glands. But that's because it's shocks body. them. Right. That's not taking right. it into your right. gut. Exactly. So that's a whole different yep. thing. Yeah. Yep. But that's uncomfortable. So we're not going to talk yeah. about that right now. We're talking about comfort things right now. Um, so, so what should I stop eating? You know, especially when I'm having a lot of inflammation. Now, like for me, my personal sort of story continues right now where I'm trying to get mold toxins out of my system. And um, what was happening was at the beginning of the day, I looked pretty normal. And by the end of the day, I was like, my stomach was like eight inches down. <laughs> and um, some of that was I needed to just go back to resetting and being more careful. So if you're having issues, is gluten one of the first things you should try to take out? Probably. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I was a bagels and cream cheese person. I said that last week a lot. And, um, and so maybe I used up all my gluten credits. I don't know. But, um, but you know, I don't like being that person that says try gluten. But if gluten's really intimidating, try something else first. I think if you get there on your own, it feels easier. Because then once you've taken it out and you see how good you feel, um, nobody has to convince you. And that was kind of my journey. Like once my daughter was born and if I breastfed her after eating gluten, she was really sick. There was no more, you know. It was easier to do it for someone else though. Um, cow's dairy, especially if it's pasteurized cow's milk, and it's often the casein protein in the cow's milk, and people think it's the lactose, and I think a lot of times it's actually the casein, the protein, not the sugar. Um, now it's also sometimes the lactose, or it's the fact that you know, raw milk will have the probiotics. We need to digest it and the pasteurized doesn't. And I don't know where to get it around here. Mitch, our wellness coach can probably secretly tell you, but um, I don't want to go to jail. So, so what, um, what's the difference between that as far as like yogurt and stuff that is fermented with dairy? Well, the only thing is it was pasteurized and then for, and then added. So I, I think making it yourself would be much better. And it's not that hard to make it. It's kind of like kombucha where once yeah. you get it going. Yeah. So if you have a dairy issue, can you usually eat something that, let's say you make it yourself and ferment it? It depends how sensitive you are to that casein protein. Mm, okay. Yeah. So it like, for the in my family, there's four of us. My seven-year-old is the most sensitive to the casein. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking within 30 minutes he acts like a child with severe ADHD and even like on the spectrum, like there is a such a significant difference in his personality um, after dairy. And because he has type one diabetes, I can watch his blood sugar go up on his monitor. And there's, it's not because he ate sugar, it's because of the inflammation that's going on with the, with the casein for him. Mm -hmm. It's easier to take it out of our house than for him to constantly, constantly be tempted at age seven. Mm -hmm. I'm sure when he leaves the house, he's gonna go through some sort of rebellion and figure it out himself, right? Yes. But um, we'll deal with that later. We've been doing raw, hard goat, yeah, like and, once a week, not at three meals a day, and he mm -hmm. seems to do okay. Yeah, so that can work better, okay? That, that can, for some, depending well, on... It's different protein. Protein. Um, is, is it, is yeah, it's different. It's different. It yeah. looks, the casein looks different. Yeah. And it's gotten easier lately to find local goat cheeses mm -hmm. like Trader Joe's has quite a few heart I'm talking about the oh, hard really? hearts yeah the soft oh. ones they often add cow's milk rennet to it which I think for my son anyways is adding cow's milk Very so this the, the cow's milk is cheaper so they're going to try to add it when they can but definitely so hard cheeses good. over soft cheeses are well, going to be mm -hmm. less likely to cause yep. disturbance yep. awesome yeah yep and of course, those things that my grandmother fed us that were like in plastic that said it cheese food on the outside, <laughs> that was probably just BPA she was giving us. Um, and those are not good. And so then I also list sugar. So I have gluten, cow's dairy, sugar. I was at, and I said this last week too, but I'm repeating myself. I was at a conference where we actually... Um, it was for molds and we, there was like 500 MDs, PAs and, and, and MPs there and someone got up on the screen and put up their slide and it said, high fructose corn syrup is a toxin. Everyone here knows that, right? And like, it's kind of interesting watching some people in the room be like, really? <laughs> Oh no, they are doctors and they didn't know it's a toxin. Um, but sugar is a little different because I think 
you know, some raw organic sugars. We, we tend to use some like coconut sugar, or I've even tried to make kombucha with it. It doesn't turn out so great, but um, I just think take that sugar bag and just get it out of your house, you know, so you're not tempted. Maybe some raw, raw local honey, if you need it in your tea, would be a good way to go. Um, you're going to detox when you take out sugar. It feels like coming off of a drug. And that's pretty much what your brain thinks is going on. So if you know that ahead of time, maybe it's easier, maybe not. I think everyone sitting here probably already knows that. Um, unsprouted grains can be tricky. So I ask people to let their almonds, even, even nuts too, or mung beans sit and sprout before they actually cook them. We talked about that a decent amount last week too. Um, and then things that are GMO'd uh, often contain herbicides and pesticides that can damage the gut lining. Um, in studies, and I actually have a list of resources at the end that I'll send out, but the Journal of Environmental Sciences also has given us a list of the foods that destroy the probiotics in your gut. So let's go ahead and just avoid those because we're working pretty hard to build them back. So what can I eat? I recommend... Oh, I make yeah. Yeah. So the yeah. thing that's common about all these things not to eat, again, is that they are dampening. And you don't want the gut to be cold or damp or hot or damp. You just don't want it to be damp. Yeah. So gluten, sugar, Dairy, those are like, from an energetic perspective, whether it's Ayurvedic or yeah. Chinese medicine, those things are, are dampening. And so mm -hmm. when we think about just, that's like kind of a basis is like, we don't want to create a damp environment in the gut. And I'll get more into that later, but yeah. mm -hmm. that's kind of, that. yeah, yeah, I figured that you're yeah. that, but just yeah. for the sake of the recording. Yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's just, that's a thing. I mean, and so, and yeah. And some of the practitioners here are more for come from the Ayurvedic aspect. Some also like, like Sarah, our acupuncturist is also a Chinese medicine doctor. So she will say the same exact things. Sometimes she words it a little differently, but uh -huh. it's the dampening. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so I like, I already mentioned bone broth contains a lot of minerals, proline, glycine, and, and potassium. Isn't it nice if we could get our minerals from our food instead of having to take a bunch of pills, you know, or even I like to do powdered, vitamins and things in water, but even that sometimes gets to be too much. Um, I already mentioned raw cultured dairy may be helpful for some people. Fermented vegetables, we, we talked about this last week too. We need to make sure your histamine bucket's not full as you add fermented foods. So we can do testing for that. You can also pretty much scratch your, your arm um, and see if a red line pop up. Oh, I'm doing good today. Um, sometimes when my histamines are high, you know, as soon as I scratch my arm, I get a bright red line. So when your histamines are high, the, the erythema comes to the skin surface pretty fast. Um, I forget the name of that. Some doctor like it has that test named after him, but. So if you don't have a bright red line, you're good? Yeah, probably. Fail proof. Now keep in mind though, this is probably a really good time of day to not have high histamines. In the mm -hmm. middle of the night is when they spike. Okay. It's also when the liver is detoxing. So if people are waking up in the middle of the night, then we can talk about what that means. Cool. Um, we don't do a workshop on insomnia, but maybe we should. Mm -hmm. um, and then steamed vegetables that are easier to digest. So when people are doing gut healing, I try to tell them no raw food. And sometimes that's really new and really they're, they're totally thrown off by that because they've been juicing or they've been, they've been doing all these things. But the reason they're coming to me is because those things haven't worked, right? So. And that, again, that's cold. And if you mm -hmm. don't have the fire in your gut to digest that, then that's just going to make things worse. It's going to increase gas and malabsorption. And yeah. so that's more coming from a place of your gut is doing well, then give it, you know, yeah. raw. And, yeah. and, and again, also in a certain amount. Some people, they think, well, raw diet is like the healthiest. And I would say that that's not yeah. true because it's just too cold. Yeah. And it takes too much fire to digest all of that. And it's not as nourishing as mm -hmm. other foods. And so that I would also add, sometimes people come to see me because they want to lose weight. And that's why they've tried the raw. Mm -hmm. And what I find a lot of times is, especially in like obesity, where someone has been holding onto that weight for 20, 30 years, they are missing certain nutrients. And so they're almost, parts of them are actually malnourished, even though they're holding onto weight, their body's holding onto weight intentionally to try to save them. And we actually need to sort of fix that metabolism issue and give them foods that are easy to digest, mm -hmm. which seems counterintuitive to them, but we don't wanna eat the raw foods that take a ton of energy and to try to break them down. Um, because their metabolism, metabolisms have intentionally s slowed down because they're not giving their bodies what they need nutritional wise. Um, 
And then healthy fats. And, and I think the reason why that I have a lot of compassion is because that message is very blurred in our, in our internet. And on, when you talk to different conventional doctors, like it's like, oh, just do low fat and do high grains. And that's obviously not what we're talking about. <laughs> we're talking about something a little bit different. Um, and then healthy fats. So egg yolks, salmon, avocados, ghee, co coconut oil. You also can't poop if you don't get enough fat. So imagine the fat kind of being like the lube you need. So you really need to, to get enough fat in order. And I find, especially with, with women and moms that are adrenal fatigued, if we eat enough fat with dinner, we don't crave the sweets after dinner. Mm -hmm. So if you can somehow prevent yourself from eating the, the sweets after dinner, I think you're going to do your gut a, a favor there. And you may sleep a lot better. Um, okay. So this is also from Josh Axe, and it's, I've already said a lot of this, so I'm not gonna actually repeat that. I did put fish oil. Fish oil is kind of highly debated right now. I have been offering people some omega-3s that are vegan if, they are, if they've been reading a lot about fish oil being sort of a waste product. The thing about fish oil is you have to do your research and get a really, really, really good fish oil. Triple distilled, no heavy metals. We don't need to be taking heavy metals in, in our supplements. Um, and then I did put a list of other vegetables, um, beetroots on here, bok choy, um, carrots, celery, chicory leaves, chickpeas, chili, chives. I mean, it's in alphabetical order and I'll send this out, but I think the key is open up your mind in terms of what are some vegetables? Could you go to the farmer's market and just walk around and learn about some things you've never even seen before and then cook them <laughs> and maybe even get a cookbook that's just vegetables, learn how to cook them, because we often grow up with vegetables being mushed, or my mom's version, and sorry if she watches this, but she knows, um, <laughs> of vegetables growing up was green peas, and I got to a certain age, and I was like, mom, those actually are not vegetables, <laughs> it's actually a leg legume, um, and so we were missing a lot of the vitamins that are in, like, green leafy vegetables, because we were, my sister was very picky, because she had a tongue tie, that's what, something we talked about last week, um, so she only wanted peas. To quickly interject also, I yeah. found like getting the CSA boxes where they give you like whatever they have an abundance of is such a good way to learn more about produce you're not familiar with and to kind of push you to try new stuff. Yeah. yeah that like changed yes. my life to learn more about different veggies. We so, got yeah. this cookbook probably seven years ago called Veganomicon and it's like kind of an old school like joy of cooking where it's like steps and all it is is vegetables and it's not trying to make vegan life look like the standard American diet. It's like actually like, you know celebrating the flavors of different vegetables. So I found that yeah. cookbook really helpful too, because I would go to the farmer's market and not know what things were. Yeah. So it was really good. Um, in a healthy colon, let me move this over. In a healthy colon, there an, an average of anywhere from 100 billion to, it says 1,000 billion, that's funny, a zillion <laughs> beneficial bacteria. Um, ah. Hi, Dr. Mead. I don't know if you can hear us, but I saw you popped on. Um, and let's see, per milliliter or one-fifth of a tea teaspoon. So up to a zillion per milliliter or one-fifth of a teaspoon. Um, in it, that's a healthy colon. In a typical American colon, the beneficial bacteria may be as low as four or five per milliliter. So very, 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 very different in terms of zeros behind those numbers. So, um, and lactobacilli and bifidobacterium are two of the most important. We actually need our good bacteria in order to make the vitamin B12. So if we don't have enough good bacteria, we're gonna be low in B12. Does taking B12 fix your bacteria? No. So we need to get to the root cause of the problem. Should you take B12 temporarily while we're working on it? Maybe. Um, a lot of people will feel much better if they do that. Um, and then I kind of have a picture of the colon. So, the idea being that all those little guys are all the healthy bacteria. And I think we talked a little bit, but if this is the patient's right side and this is their left, the right side's cut off a little bit. But over here, you would have the, the ileocecal valve, which you can massage because oftentimes the food is getting stuck or the stool's getting stuck between the small and the large intestine. And that's something that chiropractors have known for years, and I try to teach patients to do it themselves too. Um, Okay, we've already talked extensively about what kills our good bacteria, especially in last week, and about dysbiosis. So how can we test for dysbiosis? I like to use either Genova or doctor's data. There's not a, um, 
a typical lab like LabCorp request that does testing for this. And then SIBO, I like to use Genova. There is a two and a three hour test. We need to know if you're methane or hydrogen dominant for SIBO because then we can use different treatments. And SIBO is small intestinal bacterial overgrowth which just means, oh, and here it is. So basically, don't we need bacteria in our intestines? Yes, but you can have the wrong type of bacteria in your intestine. And there's some really good, oh, this is blurry. There's some really good checklists, and I actually have my own quiz I send to people if they have symptoms of SIBO, um, but it is nice also to do the quiz because it is okay to skip testing if you feel really confident that you've got it. I mean, I think we really need to go back in medicine to listening to patients and examining them instead of relying on lab tests. So um, there are patients, however, that disagree with me. Once I've said, I, I think based on your exam and your symptoms, you have this, they still would like that concrete evidence and that's okay, we can still do it. It's kind of nice to have the science too, but. Um, and then dysbiosis. So this was just an example of, um, on the left column, I get the good flora. In the middle, I get the intermediate flora. And on the right, I get the bad flora. So I can see two bad flora popped up here for this patient. One was Klebsiella, and the other, I think, was Actenobacter. And I can focus on killing the good while we also continue to, killing the bad while we continue to boost the good. And so it just gives us a better way of looking at the patient. Sometimes you can go buy a probiotic that's actually not the best one for you. And there's so many on the market. So we're gonna talk about that in a minute too. So megaspore probiotic is, I think for some people good, but there is no one size fits all. Um, I also like VSL, I like BioCult, but both of BioCult has dairy, so we can't use that for some people, like my son. Um, there's a couple Claire Labs probiotics I really like. Um, there's one by Megagenics called Ultraflora that sometimes is the most expensive, but is the best to use at least for a month or two. Um, the idea is that you're working on building up the good stuff um, and that you're incorporating more fermented foods in your diet as you heal so that you don't have to take probiotic pills forever. Um, or even making your own yogurt or kefir or something like that would be less expensive. We're not trying to do this forever, but... Um, there are some really good probiotics. I have to say though, none of those probiotics I just mentioned are available in a Whole Foods. None of them are available in Earth Fair. So you really need to go talk to a provider that will sell you these or get their link so you can order them online. Um, I know Dr. Hamid at Carolina Compounding also was carrying the Megaspore, but a lot of these are specialty probiotics that only providers have. And that's because they're so much more powerful and that's just the way the supplement world is working right now, you can spend a lot of money in a Whole Foods and just come home with basically stuff that I wouldn't consider that potent or that good at, at helping you. And that's kind of sad, especially when people come in with a whole bag that they've spent thousands of dollars. Um, there's also this new probiotic, but I cautioned last week to be careful. When somebody offers to test your gut, tell you what's wrong with it, and they'll then sell you a curated product that they've decided based on the testing from their lab is right for you, I just don't know that our science is there yet. I think that we have a lot more good bacteria that we haven't even discovered. Maybe there's nine or 10 strands we know, but there's definitely more research to come. And in some ways, what we know to be true and what has been passed down for generations to be true about the good the, the benefits of good bacteria, in some ways the science hasn't caught up yet. So I wouldn't spend $1,000 on a curated probiotic right now. Um, but that's just my, me being skeptical. So maybe people, maybe we can talk about that at the break if anyone has different. Thrive is a company that seems to be promising. Um, they are telling us that they can you know, do the testing and tell us exactly which ones we're missing and then they can make us a customized probiotic. It sounds like a really great idea. I don't know, so we'll see. I haven't had a patient do it and feel that much better. Um, I also just wanted to mention, let me just peek at the time, that there are hormones that affect hunger and fullness. And one of my, so I'm doing an online master's in functional medicine and one of the classes was basically just the hormones that are involved in digestion, one whole class. It is so much more than just leptin and ghrelin. And those are two we hear, um, but there's so many hormones. Um, and I think it makes sense because if you've ever felt something like IBS where you feel like you have a meeting coming up or you're going to meet with someone and you're nervous about it and you feel that twisting and that turning. Um, so 
we've known that this has been going on, but now we actually have all the hormones. So I also mentioned here cholecystokinin, insulin, glucagon, somastatin, I mentioned ghrelin, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, cortisol, the thyroid hormones. All of these can affect hunger and satiety. So people will tell me that they're still hungry, sometimes even when their leptin's really high, and I'm, I'm mystified because I don't have a great way to to measure all of these in one test. But the bottom line is that there's more than one hormone controlling our hunger and controlling our satiety or fullness. Um, we also need to find ways every single day to turn on the parasympathetic or the rest and digest. And I know Rachel's gonna touch on that a little bit too. So one way we can do this is sit down for five minutes. It could be in the beginning of the day, middle end, it doesn't necessarily matter. Ideally, right before we eat would be great. Close your eyes and try to put away the screen. Try to just take a minute to focus on your breathing. Um, but when we have the sympathetic hormones activated, we're not going to digest very well. And I see this with kids when they go to school because they're in such a rush and they, especially like my son goes out to, on the playground right after and he's supposed to sit and finish his lunch, especially because we've given him insulin. And sometimes he doesn't because he's so excited to get out on the playground. <laughs> um, Tongue tie or ankyloglossia we mentioned last week, but basically at the back of the tongue begins the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve ends at the bottom of the pelvis. It's the biggest nerve in the body. If you have a tongue tie and the frenulum underneath your tongue is too short, it's pulling the tongue forward. The vagus nerve may be being pulled for, forward, maybe even only a mil, millimeter, half a millimeter, but it's turning on the sympathetic hormones. So just having a tongue tie can make it that you don't digest your food. And if you don't digest your food and it's sitting there kind of in a food bolus, it starts to ferment and then things happen like SIBO. So it's all connected. What do you know? Um, I did mention digestive enzymes briefly, but digestive enzymes are not all created equal. Um, there's Claire Labs, there's pure encapsulations, there's I don't know if you guys have examples of other ones you've seen, but there's so many different ones. You need one that covers the digestive enzymes that you need for the foods you're eating. So like if I'm eating a lot of greens, I need cellulase to, to break down greens because I'm not a cow. Um, so I don't make cellulase. <laughs> so like things like that. Um, now, can you get it to the point where you don't need digestive enzymes because you've healed enough? Yes, of course. But temporarily, you may need to sort of do some research on those or, or come ask me. Um, and then where can I find local food that's not sprayed or genetically modified? So I just want to go through, maybe you guys have extra resources. Um, in Durham, the community market, the farmer's market at Central Park, every Saturday, and then when it gets warm out, every Wednesday and every Saturday, there's delivery services, Papa Spuds, Lee's, the produce box. Which one are you guys in? Uh, no, we, have, we don't do it now. I used to. Before. Which one were you in before? Not here. Not here, in no, California. Like are you in a CSA now? No, the produce box. The produce box. Term. Uh huh. Yep. And then the Western Wake Farmers Market is great. That's one of the best one in terms of organic farming. Um, in Chapel Hill, the Weaver Street Market, um, or in Carborough, in the Raleigh area, I actually have. I put down sprouts in Falls of Noose, but there's a sprouts in Durham now too. Hilltop Farms, if you're down in Willow Springs or Holly Springs, is amazing. It's not that far from Holly, Holly Springs. The only, it's the only um, organic farm down there. I actually used to go to the Holly Springs Farmer's Market because we lived down there. And I remember talking to a strawberry farmer, conventional strawberry farmer, about how she could grow strawberries without spraying them. And she told me I was lying. And then, you know, next to her was, was the Hilltop Farms one that, where he didn't spray. But the problem is sometimes when farming's passed down from generation to generation and they've done it a certain way and it is such a big investment, they're trying to do everything they can to not have their crop die. And if it's something that's really outside the box and they haven't necessarily like gone to school to learn how to grow this organically, it's very daunting to go through it. And especially because there's like eight years right when they're turning the land over to organic. But sometimes you can find a farm that is transitioning. Like that's at the Durham farmer's market a lot. Farms that are transitioning from conventional to organic will be less expensive, but they haven't sprayed. Now what's sitting in their soil, it's probably not perfect, but it, it, it is a good, you know, affordable way. You can also go to the Environmental Working Group website, EWG, and just check the Dirty Dozen and the Clean 15. I think we talked about that last week too. So which foods are most important that, you know, to not be sprayed? Um, Fickle Creek Farm is great in Effland. 
Girls in the Garden, that one is in Rougemont, but I think they go to the Western Wake. Local Seafood, there's a place in Raleigh. Do you guys know that one, Local Seafood? No. There's one in Durham too, but I'm forgetting the name of both of those. I'll, I'll email those out though. Um, Two Bridges Farm is in Lewisburg and his, his email's on here. Um, Fox Farm, so you could get, you could forage for mushrooms. Um, they also drop off or deliver. Let's see, New Pasture Farm has beef, pork, chicken, lamb, bone broth, pasteurized dairy, um, but organic. Fermented foods, they also have from New Pasture. They also do a personalized vegetable box. So if you know your kids are not gonna eat certain things, it's really nice to go in there and pick. Um, and New Pasture Farms, our uh, contact person is Cindy and her info's on here. And then Darn, Dawnbreaker Farms, people seem to love too. I think he's in Effland also, but I might be wrong. The state farmer's market in Raleigh can be really frustrating sometimes if you walk in there because there's nobody that's not spraying, but Ronnie Moore's stall does not spray, not to be confused with Beth Moore's. They're like brothers or cousins or something. Brothers. One doesn't spray and one does. Um, and then the barefoot stall at the state farmer's market has fresh strawberries with no pesticides. Mm -hmm. There's several family members at farms and some are not spraying mm -hmm. and some are. Yeah. So they combine it and make the best way to yeah. uh -huh. You don't know what. Yeah. You have to, yeah. Kind of have to talk to the actual farmer who's not always there, right? Um, what questions did we have? Because I went through things a little bit faster than I intended, but I'm from New Jersey, so I talk fast. <laughs> Anything yeah, come up that we didn't? The probiotic thing is, you know, like right now, because I'm dealing with the mold stuff, I'll tell you personally, I'm taking double the Ultra Flora dose um, for the Metagenics brand. It's not cheap, but it's really helping me to heal my gut from the mold toxins that I was, was in, in our old building and in the previous house where I lived. Um, so I think the key is, can you muscle test yourself just to see which probiotics right for you? Or can you talk to someone who's had a lot of experience with the more like practitioner exclusive brands? You can spend a whole lot of money buying probiotics that don't work though and for you. And that's really frustrating. Um, I mentioned the glutamine and aloe. There's also combinations, like there's a powder by Zymogen that's got a bunch of different things all in one. So you can just take a scoop of the powder instead of having to take glutamine, aloe, probiotic, prebiotic. You don't have to go through all the steps. Is aloe like, are you recommending it in a certain form? Like are those aloe drinks not really? They usually have sugar. sugar. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've never tried them. Yeah. They're, so there's aloe gel and aloe juice. Mm -hmm. Aloe gel is going to be more like if you're constipated mm -hmm. and you need to have a bowel movement. Yeah. It's more of a purgative. Where the juice is just more um, cooling, anti-inflammatory, and lubricating. Yeah. And giving, mm -hmm. bringing moisture to your body and to your bowels. So. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the gel can be aggravating because it can be too purgative. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that the, the juice is what you should go go for, generally speaking. Yeah. 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 And I do think um, aloe capsules that are like are on full script, where I can send them to people, don't seem to work. And I think Rachel's going to talk a little bit too about like forms of herbs is are very important. Uh, okay. We're taking so many things in capsules, but then if you look at your poop and it's full of capsules, <laughs> clearly you didn't digest that. Yeah. <laughs> So, well, let's take about five minutes to just stand up and stretch and um, sitting all day is not good for our digestion either. I'm going to pause this. All the things. Oh. Okay, we're recording again. So whenever we want to start, it's okay. good. So um, I'm just going to kind of go through some things that you all maybe already are burst in, but just for the sake of the recording to kind of go with what Kate has said and what I've talked about before. And I'm not burst in. <laughs> You're not burst in. Okay, great. So yeah, so we talked about, we talked about dampness and how the gut does not want to be damp um, because that's going to create sluggish digestion. That's going to cool digestive fire. And then that's going to basically create a swamp, which bacteria loves to breed in. And that's how things like leaky gut 
are in and uh, candida and inflammation that's how that's all coming from so that's sort of the the landscape of the of the gut that is not um in a good state um and as well aside from diet as kate mentioned before stress is huge and i think that everybody kind of knows that but it's like oh i'll think about that later or like but this is more important now to think about and I think everybody kind of gets an idea about the impact of stress, but somehow we still prioritize those things over how do we minimize stress. Um, but stress is like, in my opinion, stress is like irritable bowel when they want to say that. That's basically like you're not managing your stress, you know. Um, and it's hard in this day and age with technology, with the way that our society and our lives are structured. but. That's why so many people have, one of the reasons why so many people have gut problems is not managing stress. Um, Cause basically that's going in out of the, it's going into the fight or flight mode and it's taking blood away from the digestive organs and it's impacting your ability to digest and it's sending it out into your muscles for fight or flight. So when you have lack of blood in the organs, you have lack of function. And so stress is huge. Stress is really, a big thing to um, regulate. So, you know, a good place to start is when you're eating and setting intention with your meals. Um, you know, it's, it's interesting to think of prayer with meals. It's sort of like a thing that is, you know, people don't really do anymore, <laughs> or I don't know what people do, but you know, it was like a thing that like, oh, when I was a kid, we prayed at the table, you know, but whatever it is, just even if you just sit there before you sit down and start gobbling, just like, you know, appreciate your food, look at it, smell it, you know, just the simple things of, you know, being grateful that you have this food to eat. But that intention will, is also a stress relieving practice to, to do that. Um, and also, you know, being intentional with how you're appreciating the food, slowly chewing it, really using your senses, um, relaxing, not doing other things while you're eating. I think a lot of, for a lot of people, eating is function, you know, like I just have to nourish myself. This is like one thing I have to do. It's like, okay, you know, like not everyone is like really into food like I am, but, but still thinking about it as like, well, yeah, function, but your body has to function. So what can you do to make your meal experience, um, function better basically for your digestion. So those are just some basic things, but they're really, really important. Um, and as well, don't eat and drive. <laughs> as you said before, that's huge. You know, people are eating, driving, talking to the phone all at once. And it's like, you might as well just not eat. You know, I mean, you might as well not eat because you're not going to get the nutrients. You're going to create a problem that's going to, not only are you not getting the nutrients, you're contributing to a problematic environment in the gut. So eating and driving is really not good. So we want to eat with um, intention. Um, and I'll go into this more in a minute, but taking bitters before every meal is, um, as an herbalist, there's like a few, there's like three things that every, that an herbalist will recommend, like everybody should do this. And bitters is one of those things. And bitters are a classification of herbs that are bitter and they um, improve digestion, they improve secretions, they improve, um, they enhance hydrochloric acid, they enhance bile production, and they enhance absorption and digestibility of food. Um, so that's something that you wanna take 10 to 20 minutes before every meal. If you forget, you could do it in the middle of a meal or after a meal. Um, so I'll get back to bitters in a second when I go over herbs specifically. Um, another thing about eating is you don't wanna eat and drink together. Um, water, is going to dilute your digestive juices. So, you know, you go to a restaurant, there's water, you, people generally have water with their food. That is just diluting the, the digestive juices that you have. So ideally you run it, drink like 30 minutes before a meal or two hours afterwards is like ideal. Obviously you're thirsty, you're thirsty, but don't go gulp a ton of water. Um, try to keep food and drink separate. Um, and as well, I kind of mentioned before, but warm water is better than cold water because that's going to shock the system. And there are ways that shocking the system is beneficial, but not when you want to shock the inside of the gut. Um, 
So also eating lacto-fermented foods, which Kate touched upon, um, if you're in a major state of inflammation, it, that's maybe not something you want to do, uh, right? You know, you want to get on your healing path um, because that can be aggravating if you have a lot of histamines. But once that your gut is on the path to healing, um, it's a rich source of probiotics that your body can really absorb and um, it's good for you. Um, and as well, drinking a warming digestive tea after meals. So that water is going to dilute your digestion. But if you're drinking herbs, that can actually help with digestion. So it's really, you don't want to drink water. You don't want to drink soda. You know, milk is kind of like, well, it's kind of like food. I mean, obviously, we're not trying to drink milk here. Basically. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but um, drinking a warming digestive tea about 30 minutes after a meal is going to, um, usually those herbs are called carminative herbs. They help improve digestion. They help to, um, to regulate gas, to move gas through the body. Um, basically any of the aromatic spices are um, carminative herbs. Um, so chai tea is really wonderful for that. Uh, an Ayurvedic formula is cumin seed, coriander seed, and fennel. Um, so drinking these um, warming teas after meals can also help with uh, digestion. Should CCF be used in combination or are just the individual ones? Okay? No, it's a combination. The okay. CCF is a combination. And I do. And with that one, you want to actually decoct. So um, I, I um, have another handout that I forgot to make. But um, with herbs, if it's a leaf you want and you're making a tea, you can pour water on it and make tea, like you know. But with seeds, berries, yeah. roots, you want to cook it. So with the CCF, you do equal parts of those seeds, and you're going to want to bring it to a boil and then simmer for like 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that, but with the cocktails, I like to tell people, yeah, make a big batch for a few days, and then you can just heat it up after dinner, yeah. so you're not having to go through that whole process for a cup of tea. Um, but that one is really, really helpful for just increasing digestion, re reducing bloating. Um, yeah. Also, fennel is great. Eating some fennel seeds um, mm -hmm. is really good. But these are all going to help with gas and bloating and to just increase um, your digestion. And just to point out, chai tea is not what they make at Starbucks. Right, right. <laughs> chai, chai tea is um, the herbs in chai, cardamom, cinnamon, ginger, clove, um, sometimes cardamom, uh, coriander, peppercorn. Those are like chai spices. So you don't even need it to be in a black tea. That's what I was going to ask. Like beyond the Starbucks version, most of the time you're finding it mixed with black. Is it still beneficial or are you kind of losing the benefits of it? No, you can still get the benefits. It's just a question of like, um, the black tea, the caffeine, yeah. you know, black tea is going to be astringent. It's going to be drying. So, um, if you're already struggling with issues like that, I mean, I think that you're better off having an herbal tea. You don't really want to do a, a yeah. black tea. Um, but you can get, I mean, the most basic would be to get like a decaf chai, but you can also get herbal chais. Okay. Um, yeah. So, um, and one of the things I see most frequently causing people's problems is chronic dehydration. So yeah. I wouldn't recommend anyone to have caffeine. Yeah. It's, and, and tea is just so stringent. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So best to be purely herbal. So thanks for that clarification. Yeah. Sometimes, you know, when you're in the herbal world, you kind of forget that you have to like. <laughs> there are other things outside. I know. <laughs> like, oh yeah, there's Starbucks. The chai tea syrup is good, right? That's what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> um, so those are just some like basic uh, tips on uh, how to increase digestion. And then getting more specifically into the herbs. Um, so the goal with herbs is to increase absorption, increase secretions, and increase elimination. Um, so there's different, you know, there's a whole herbal protocols you can do for healing the gut, um, which involves like oftentimes I'll do a, a, a glutamine approach with certain herbs that are, um, have on here vulnerary. So vulnerarys promote tissue healing. Those are not specifically digestive herbs, but they are herbs that are going to be helpful if you have a leaky gut. 
because we want to promote that tissue healing. So those are going to be um, generally anti-inflammatory and also they're just going to help to repair the tissue. So plantain, comfrey, and calendula. Um, Comfrey has a little bit of a bad rep because many years ago it was contaminated, like there's alkaloids depending on when it was harvested. And that's why a lot of times you do want to work with an herbalist. You don't want to just go out and take comfrey, but that is a vulnerary. Um, so when you're working with something like le leaky gut, that is good to work with an herbalist instead of just saying like, oh yeah, this is you know, let me heal my gut with this because it is part of this larger protocol, but I did want to put that on here to inform people that there are herbs that can be a part of the groundwork of saying it's time to repair. And um, so that is one technique. So when we're healing the gut, we want to do that. We also want to use anti herbal anti-inflammatories. So those would be um, chamomile, licorice, peppermint, calendula, um, so again, this is, this is kind of like, what I would do is integrate all of these into a formula for someone. And if someone's working with Kate, then she would kind of come up with a lot of supplements and then we would also add in an herbal tea that's gonna help to heal the tissues, to reduce inflammation. And then another one that's really great are the category of demulsants. And demulsants are herbs that are rich in mucilage. And when you mix them with water, they become slimy and they soothe and protect irritated and inflamed tissue. And that goes down the entire length of the bowel. So starting in the mouth, throat, esophagus, all the way down. So it has a similar, um, it's similar to aloe, is that their, their aloe is also um, a debulsant where it's gonna coat that tissue. It's not gonna heal, which is why we'll use the vulnerables. That's gonna be more healing, but it's, relieving and it's soothing. That's something more you would have like regularly. That is something that you can have regularly. Like if you already have a healthy gut, for example, this is something that would be beneficial just on the day. So demulsants, it's, it gets a little tricky because demulsants are of a damp nature. Mm -hmm. If you think about something that's like cool and slippery. Yeah. So they're really good for inflamed tissue. Mm -hmm. You know, they're great for a sore throat. They're great for, um, you know, constipation, they're great for inflammation in the gut. Um, if you were to take them every day, they may be too moistening yeah. and, and be too damp for the, for, the, um, for the gut, for the internal balance. So I use them personally like, okay, I'm in the desert. Let's get those demulsants. I'm in a dry climate or um, that's the main time that I use it or summertime yeah. when it's really hot outside. It's going to add that moisture to your body. Or if there's some constipation, that's going to be really helpful, as is aloe, to just soothe the tissues and to moisten them. It's just a slippery, moistening situation. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and they also will reduce mus muscle spasms that can cause gas because it's, again, it's like it's soothing. Um, and for chronic digestive issues, you want to use on an empty stomach between meals because you want to have that time when the gut isn't filled with other stuff to, to soothe it with, um, with the demulcent. So you can see I listed some. Um, um, and I don't know, like maybe you could let me know how much I should go into the specifics. But one thing about demulcents is you have marshmallow and slippery elm. I'll go into those a little bit. Marshmallow is the root. Um, and the current candy we have, or whatever marshmallows today, were made originally from the root because they're demulcent and they're gooey, so you would cook them and mix them with sugar, and then it was like a natural marshmallow candy. So marshmallows that we have, the synthetic things we have today, came from this. Um, and if you're using marshmallow tea, you want to use the root, and you want to do a cold infusion because hot water is not going to get out that mucilage. So you would just put the marshmallow root in a jar with some cold water and let it sit overnight. And then that's, you're gonna get that property out. Same thing with slippery elm. Um, you're gonna to wanna to do a cold infusion. Slippery elm is common for sore throats and coughs. It is very um, over harvested. So I generally don't recommend slippery elm to people because um, 
for environmental and conservation reasons and marshmallow works just as well. So I always like to have some marshmallow root on hand at home. So you're, oh, you know, I'm feeling this inflammation. I'm feeling kind of constipated. Let me just make a cup of this marshmallow tea. And then depending on how much you use, depends on how mucilaginous it is. So a typical dose of tea is one tablespoon of herb per cup of water. Excuse me, with marshmallow, you're gonna to wanna to use more. So depending on what you can tolerate, but I like to get it really, really thick. And it's kind of got this rooty, earthy taste, um, but you, it's almost just like this like, it's almost gooey. It's like, it's like aloe juice, if you know that. It's like slippery, but it's still like liquid. So I think of like how chia seeds congeal too. Is it? Yeah. It's less thick. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so marshmallow is a really great one to have around. And licorice is primarily used for its anti-inflammatory properties, but it also does have a demulcent. So sometimes we're looking at what is the main property, what is the secondary property? Um, so I just put licorice on there because it has a demulcent property, but you're not going to go to licorice as your, oh, as your star demulcent, but it does have that effect. So um, again, this is kind of just a brief general overview of the herbs. Licorice, there are some contraindications with that. So it is good to work with an herbalist if you're gonna be making formulas. But marshmallow is very safe, very easy to have. I would definitely recommend that as a herb that people have at home. Is that safe for pregnant and lactating women? Marshmallow, mm -hmm. it's very safe, definitely. And are some of these also killing some of the viruses or bad bacteria? Yeah. So I think that's what's so fascinating about herbs is they don't just have one purpose. Exactly. Yeah. So um, most like the, when we're looking at the vulnerabilities, the calendula and the plantain, they have some of that, like plantain does have, uh, calendula <laughs> does have an antifungal mm -hmm. and an antimicrobial, but it's not one of the heavy hitters for that. Mm -hmm that's when we kind of get back to bitters. So I'm sort of going from the bottom to the top here, but um, bitters and carminatives and demulcents, those are the three categories of herbs that would be helpful for everyone to sort of have in their repertoire cabinet if they want to integrate herbs into their life. Um, the bitters are, those are the herbs that are stimulating digestion, improving digestion. They are also, adding in liver detoxification and the flow of the bile. But a lot of them are antimicrobial as well. So depending on what is going on with the full picture would be what, what bitters I would recommend. You can buy bitters formulas in any sort of natural food store and that will do the job, generally speaking. If you have a complicated health pattern, then it is good to say, okay, well, which herbs are going to be good for me and my situation. Um, so I love Oregon grape. That's a wonderful antimicrobial. Um, it's also great for the liver. It's great for the large, intest large intestine. There's um, every one of these herbs that are bitter herbs have a multitude of purposes. So that would be the difference in having a custom made bitter formula versus just getting a general formula of which there are many. And they're pretty good if you get a good formula. Um, the thing about bitters is that with herbs, there's three ways to take them. You can take a tea, you can take a capsule, and you can take a tincture. A tincture is a, an alcohol extract of the herb. Um, with bitter, the only option is to take a tincture because the capsule is going straight to your gut. And with bitters, we are starting the digestive process in the mouth. So you put that bitter in your mouth and you're immediately increasing secretions. You're increasing saliva. You're giving your body this alert. Okay, get ready. Here we go. You know, like time to digest. Whereas if you take a pill, it's just going to go right down and it's not going to have that whole effect where digestion starts in the mouth. You could take a tea, but bitters are bitter and no one's going to want to drink a bitter tea. And it's not going to be as potent as, um, as a tincture. So tinctures with most, um, with herbs, oftentimes you have a choice. Which way do you want to take it? With bitters, you don't have a choice. You're going to take a tincture if you're going to take bitters and have them be effective. So this is just something you put a few drops in your mouth and mm -hmm. then you go? Okay. 
Yep. Um, also, just as a side, with tinctures, um, I like to, I recommend to people, oh, put some in some water and take it with bitters. You just put it directly in your mouth because, again, we don't want to dilute it. Mm -hmm. And can, can it be glycerin or no? No, because glycerin is sweet. Mm -hmm. um, and some of that bitterness will kind of come through, but the glycerin is so sweet yeah. that it really... And that's what I mean by don't walk into Whole Foods and spend your patient. Definitely. Because they, it's, it can be in glycerin there. Definitely. Yeah. Or even, I mean, yeah, it, it's very easy. There's so many products. It's very easy to kind of pick a generic one that's really not going to be that helpful, you know? So how do you get up to kids in since... And with the teachers make them alcohol. I alcohol. just put some honey in it and mm -hmm. then they'll take it. It's a tiny, tiny bit of alcohol that they're getting. Yeah. I mean, generally, um, for children, you can, if it's not the bitter formula, you can um, put it in some hot water and then the, um, the alcohol will evaporate. But kids can have, I mean, it's such a small amount of alcohol, the dose is so small, and you do a smaller dose for children that it's not a, a problem. Now, some people, it's, we, we did have a, um, a patient that she had so, such, so much like candida that just taking the tincture was like, gave her a major flare up. Um, the and, alcohol, she the was alcohol. so sensitive. She was oh, so crazy. sensitive that she couldn't, and that is not something that normally happens, but when she told me what was happening, I was like, it must be the alcohol because it's not the herbs. I knew that the herbs would not have that effect. Um, so I do like, I do recommend in general with taking tinctures, you put the tincture in some boiling in a little bit of boiling water and let the steam go up and some of the alcohol will evaporate that way. Mm -hmm. um, an alternative to tinctures are glycerites where the medium of extraction is glycerin instead of alcohol. I don't really, and, and people like to use those for kids. Um, I don't really recommend those because glycerin does not extract as strongly as alcohol. So a lot of time that product is not really gonna work because you're not getting the properties you need from the glycerin extraction. Um, yeah, you, as a sort of like nerdy side note, what you can do is you can make a tincture and then you can do what's called a solvent exchange, which I do, is you have a tincture that's made in alcohol and then you transfer it to glycerin. So you're basically cooking all the alcohol out. I wish they sold that. I can't find anyone selling that. And it's because it's a lot of labor. Um, and people are just like, well, let's just sell the glycerite. That's what people want because most people don't know. Yeah. So it's a better market to just make the glycerite and sell it that way. Um, this is like a billion dollar industry. This is not, I know. <laughs> you have to be careful. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. With what you mentioned about the tincture, so you said oftentimes you'll recommend putting it in boiling water. So say you had an herbal tincture and you're supposed to put five drops in your mouth you would just put that five drops in like a cup of water per se that was boiling and then drink it um yeah so to just to clarify a little bit a yeah. standard tincture drop is a half a teaspoon okay so that's about two uh, dropper like holes okay mm -hmm. and then i like to put it in a shot glass and pour in just a little okay. boiling water okay. i mean you can put in as much water as you want but then you're having to drink that whole thing. Yep. So I like to think of it as like a medicinal shot. Cool. Pour in a little boiling water, let it sit for five minutes, let the steam come up, and then shoot it. Cool. You know? <laughs> New way to do shots. <laughs> it's a good thing to replace. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right? Like, this is my um, So the thing about, one of the things about bitters is that, um, that most of the bitter herbs are of a cold nature. So... We, we think of things in terms of um, an herb, there's warming, there's cooling, there's drying, and there's moistening. So like most demulcents are gonna be cooling and moistening, which is great for hot and flame tissue, but it's not great to put a ton of that in your gut if you're already dealing with a damp gut. So bitters are, with the exception of one, generally cool. So if you have a cold constitution and you're cold all the time and, um, then you're going to want to take a little bit less or you're going to want to add in warming herbs. So again, that's kind of where you get into this nuance of working with someone because you can put in like ginger. So a lot of bitter formulas will have carminatives, which are the herbs that help to dispel gas. They're the aromatic herbs. They're generally pretty warming because we want to, you know, keep the gut warm from an energetic perspective um, as well. So a bitter formula, it's a combination. Bitter carminative is really nice. 
Um, so ginger can be added, but we don't want the bitter formula to be too cooling if that person has a cool constitution. Um, and in the initial stages of treatment for leaky gut, for, um, yeah, for leaky gut and gut issues, we don't actually want to use bitters because it's, that's more like you're stabilized because it can be aggravating if you're already, if you're coming in, you know, coming in from a place of like major deficit, major inflammation, the bitters are, you're not ready for them yet. So it's not a like, but if you're just like, oh, you know, I could improve my digestion, it's not that bad, then, you know, throw some bitters in. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of all over the place. Does anyone have any questions? Um, so for someone who gets floating after eating, uh -huh. once in a while, um, what do you recommend? Yeah, so that's when you would want to use a, the carminative herbs. Um, so that's going to help to just calm the digestive, di digestive tract and to ease discomfort by flatulence, move it through, um, and um, yeah, and to help to uh, alleviate that bloating. But also, if you take bitters at the beginning, that can help to um, prevent bloating. Yeah. Carla, who does the access bars here, she also just did a video a few weeks ago on CCF, and I like how she said CCF because it helped me remember it, um, but cumin, coriander, and fennel. And she talks about how, like, that's why that's one of her go-tos in the winter months, but it was just kind of nice to have it in a video form, too, so I can send that out, too, because she does good videos. So she doing her videos well? Mm -hmm. Um... Yeah, but the, the carminative tea after meals can be a nice, I mean, you can do a carminative, again, with most digestive herbs, unless you're specifically working to heal the gut, when you're doing your baseline to just um, improve digestion, you don't really want to take a capsule, because that's involving this whole breakdown process, and you want to eliminate that. So we'd rather do teas for car carminative, we can do tea or tincture, and for bitter, we just want to do tincture. It's probably the only realm in herbs where it's really specific that you don't want to take capsules. And I mean, and that's the thing is they will probably sell bitter capsules. Like, you know, yeah. and that's just Apple crazy. Apple vinegar capsules, which uh, do not work yeah. at all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So with the carminative, like you said, the tea, it's fine to have whatever, like as soon as you finish eating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously like have a cup, don't drink, you know, yeah. a bowl. but you know, a cup of it is fine. Yeah, I mean, I think that it's best to maybe wait 30 minutes and then do it. Okay. That would be ideal, is to not do it immediately on top of it. But yeah. Yeah. And what about Kachari, Rachel? Could you oh, yeah. touch on that? Oh, yeah, we'll touch on that. And I'll also talk about a couple other things. Um, so another Ayurvedic uh, formula that is fantastic is Tripala. It's a T-R-I-P-H-A-L-A. -A. And that is a of um, three different herbs um, and it is I can't even tell you everything it does because it's amazing but they all do different things and ultimately they help to really like improve digestion and tonify the gut um, it, that is something that I would recommend that every elderly person take um, and that is best taken as a pill um, because I've never really seen a tincture preparation of it and I used to take it as a powder, but it's kind of bitter, so it's much easier to take as a pill. And that is something that I would recommend to take regularly, um, not necessarily with meals, like take it at night. Um, but it, whenever I travel and digestion is, it gets disrupted, I take it um, two or three times a day. Um, so it's not something as part of a protocol specifically to anything, but it is a really wonderful formula for just strengthening the digestive system and um, having proper organ function, proper elimination, toning things, just getting things um, in tip-top shape. Great for a lot of different complaints. Um, very So that's kind of a general intro to it, but it's very general. It works on a lot of different aspects of the digestion. It seems to help people that I see that have gallbladder issues as well, or when they're trying to do a liver cleanse, mm. and they have a complete bowel movement, like after a coffee enema, where they haven't had a complete bowel movement in months and months. Yeah. 
it really normalizes and regulates bowel movements. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And elimination um, helps with hemorrhoids. It just, it really is one of my favorites. This is Trifala. Did I say it right now? Trifala. Yeah, Trifala, Trifala. Yeah. Trifala. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned there's three herbs in it. What are the three herbs? Um, Amla. I, I let's see if I can remember. Amla, like Harataki or something. I don't even know what they. They're all like um, Ayurvedic herbs. Um, what's the other one? Are you looking it up? They all seem to be fruits. They're, they're all fruits. Right? They're all berries. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is that safe for pregnant and breastfeeding women? I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah, I have to we look can. into that. That's why it's good to come see Rachel because she can ask about stuff. everything. <laughs> um, what about stuff like adding ground spices like turmeric and ginger into your food? Are Great, you, love it's, that. It's helpful. Definitely. Okay. Definitely, depending, it's not necessarily of a therapeutic dose. Yeah. But it's always helpful to it's add. Nice. I mean. Like in a lot of ethnic cuisines, there's a lot of commendative herbs. Like a lot of spices are commendative, and they all and they often improve digestion. Yeah, I was just spices. curious about like how they're produced, if it's really effective. All right. Yeah, I mean it is definitely effective because they're pure and they're just dried into your stomach. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. It's just it's often not enough. Mm -hmm. But um, that gets to um, kitchari or kachari. Yeah, yeah. I say everything different. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> It's like um, when I was in school and it was the chemist said things totally different than the biochemist. Uh, it's like the same word. You just <laughs> yeah. It's fun. So this is another um, Ayurvedic food, and it is um, it's basically a gruel that's really helpful for convalescent. That's how it's tradition traditionally used, helpful in um, convalescing from illnesses. Very easy to digest, mm -hmm. and it's um, mung beans and rice. Sometimes it's like a split mung lentil, but I use the mung beans. Um, and ideally it would all be soaked and sprouted, but the, it does, it's also nice because you don't have to soak it. So um, you just cook, you can get recipes for it. There's a lot of different recipes with the rice and the mung bean, but it's a great, um, it's very nutritive and it's just so easy to digest. So it's a good thing to eat during cleanses or if you're just having a lot of um, reaction to foods. I like to cook it in a bone broth, so you're getting that rich bone broth nutrition, and then mixing it with the bean and rice. Yeah, and you can add some greens. Oh, you, you can, can add greens to it at the end. Oh, and also, so when I make that, is I add a lot of turmeric, and to get that, to get the properties of turmeric. So, you know, turmeric can be very drying. So turmeric, there's a lot of turmeric added to that, but then you also add ghee. So then you're getting that lubrication, so you're counteracting. So a lot of what we do is we don't want something to be too cool or too drying, so we're adding herbs to kind of create a balance. Um, so I like to add turmeric and ghee and then greens at the end to the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And could you add some powdered, like you talked a little bit about the mucilaginous, but there was one patient where we kind of suggested that he did some more of the mucilaginous like marshmallow on top of the kachari. Can you do powder? Sure. Because yeah. I feel like some patients it's just in the capsule is just the worst way to do it. I would not do it in the capsule. Yeah. If I still think doing it as a tea is mm -hmm. going to be ideal because you're already creating this lubricating um, product. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, the herbs will interact with your body and create that, but it's not going to be as potent as if you actually drink the decoction or the infusion of the demulsin. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. What about products like, for example, I buy the Trader Joe's ginger turmeric tea. Is that kind of worthless? Um, typically with, with tea bags, yeah. for a therapeutic dose, you're going to have to use two or three bags. So it just uh -huh. gets really expensive. Yep. Whereas if you're using loose herbs, but if I'm drinking like two or three bags in a day, is that going to be the same or it needs to be kind of all at once concentrated? Um, well, two or three bags a day is basically going to be like a standard dose, depending on what you're taking. If yeah. you're taking it therapeutically or if you're like taking it just for general yeah. well-being. A standard dose for tea is one cup three times a day. And you're making one cup of tea with one tablespoon of herbs. Mm -hmm. And you think about the herb in a tea bag, it's very, very ground down. Mm -hmm. So 
It's maybe like a teaspoon. Yeah. So that's why I say two. <laughs> so then if you were doing a therapeutic dose, you'd need to use at least six tea bags yeah. a day. Um, so if you were taking that as an anti-inflammatory, let's say, um, for a specific purpose, um, you know, it's not going to be, it's going to be good for you, but it wouldn't be a therapeutic dose. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then my daughter had a corn allergy, and we actually learned that the tea bags are sprayed with a corn product to prevent mold. Yeah. If I drink tea from a tea bag and then there's her, she reacted. Right? Oh, wow. Yeah. Corn is everywhere. That's crazy. And it's not the good corn. It's yeah. It's the GMO Monsanto sprayed corn. Yeah. I've also heard that there's plastic involved in those tea mm -hmm. bags as well. So you're, yeah. Um, okay, yeah. Very, very tea bags. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, I always say loose leaf and then strain. Um, you know, and I realized that I'm kind of, there could be a whole class on just like how to take herbs. Um, mm -hmm. so I'm kind of, I'm realizing that as we're doing this, that I'm like, it's a little I bit. Take your <laughs> <laughs> um, another herb that I'll just throw out there that doesn't really have to do with dig digestion, but it is still important is, um, along with bitters, I recommend that everyone drink nettle tea. Mm -hmm. Nettles are like your natural multivitamin, except you can actually absorb it. Um, so it's very high in magnesium, calcium, um, lots of different vitamins and minerals. Um, along with being highly nutritive, it's also a anti-inflammatory and it also cleanses the blood of toxins. Um, so it's, it's really a wonderful, wonderful plant that if everyone were drinking a cup of nettle tea a day, they would in my opinion, have improved health because you are going, basically giving yourself nutrition and you're cleaning up the body. Um, so the nettles are an herb. Because they are popular, they're generally at most natural food mm -hmm. stores, like in bulk. Um, you can get them in a tea bag, but again, I mean, with nettles, I actually recommend doing a standard dose of tea. It's one tablespoon per cup. For nettle, I would say three tablespoons per mm. cup at least. Um, so that's why, like the nettle tea bag, oh, that's a nice tea, but like for a therapeutic dose, because you really want to get that, that nutrition in there. Um, and that's another one that I recommend doing an overnight infusion so that you're really having the time to get all the nutrients out. Um, otherwise, with a tea, you want to steep it for about 15 minutes to get the therapeutic properties, but for nettle, like eight hours, and then you're going to get a lot more of those minerals and vitamins than if you just do it for 15 minutes. So with the cold infusion, do you suggest heating it up when you drink it, before you drink it? Um, yeah. I mean, sometimes I drink cold nettle tea because it's like a nice, like if it's warm outside. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you can just heat it up. Is that something you recommend multiple times a day or that three tablespoons per cup once a day is pretty good? I think that that's, that's fine. Just to drink a cup, um, once a day is a good health practice. It's basically like getting a mega dose of greens. Um, and then also, you know, doing some other things. Um, I even use more than three tablespoons. That would be the minimal. Mm -hmm. Um, but I just take a mason jar. You can do a, a quart or what's the other one? Pint? No, the yeah, pint's yeah, a little yeah. one. Two cups is a pint. Oh, two cups. And I would fill it up like an inch. So that's more than three tablespoons, but I like a really rich tea. Just fill it in, fill it up an inch with nettles, put water on it, put it in the fridge, let it sit overnight, strain it, heat it up. Yeah, do you have to refrigerate cold infusions or can you leave them out? Um, you know, you, you can leave them out too. Yeah. Um, right. but nettles, like, they can go off quickly. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, not like overnight, it would be yeah. fine. But I just, I don't know. I, I gen generally That's one of the ones that like to keep it cold. Yeah. Someone asked me this week about microwaving their tea with the water. And I said, no, I actually want you to, if you have to microwave, heat up your water in the microwave and then add your tea. Definitely. That's like, do you don't want to microwave the herbs. No. <laughs> right? Yeah. I don't know. No. I don't that's a good. Um, so, so for a nettle tea, why do you say? Can use a cold infusion instead of hot. Well, you could do hot, you could do cold. That kind of doesn't really matter. You just want to let it sit for eight hours. So it's kind of just like. This is I, a leaf, right? 
It's a leaf. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. It's a little different. It can really go either way for the convenience. It's just, I'm just like, okay, throw some cold water on it. Let it sit. It doesn't really have to be boiled in my opinion, um, but it could be boiled. Uh, but since you're just letting it sit for that long, I'm like, there's no really a need to boil it. Is that what's safe for pregnant and breastfeeding? Yeah, that's really good for pregnant and breastfeeding women. And that can often be mixed up in a, there's other herbs that are really good for, yeah. like raspberry leaf and nettle go really well together. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering because like I had a book for postpartum that had a lot of herbal infusions and she mm -hmm. always recommended boiling, pouring over the boiling water and leaving it, but that's kind of unnecessary. I mean, sounds like. I think so. In general. Yeah. She, she said to boil over and leave it for how long? Overnight. Okay. So okay. you're basically doing a cold infusion, but you're boiling first. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think it's fine. To, some people won't be like, you know, you have to boil. Like, I, I mean, you could yeah. if you feel like, oh, maybe there's this no would be better. Way. Yeah, there's no harm. I think it's fine to do it cold. And do you have sources for Yeah, tea? yeah, actually, I, um, I do, yeah. Um, I have another handout of sources, but I can tell you. Um, like, what I honestly recommend doing is buying metal in bulk. Buy a pound of nettles and just get into making that loose leaf nettle tea. So um, I recommend Pacific Botanicals. And Mountain Rose Herbs. With packaged teas, do you find some brands that are better than others? The ones that take tea bags? Yeah, I mean, I like tradi traditional medicinals. Yeah. yeah, that's a good one. And I think Yogi is pretty good. I mean, some of their formulas, I feel like, are, are still kind of gimmicky. Like, even mm -hmm. these companies that, like, I think that you can trust Yogi and traditional medicinals to be using a high-quality herb. Yeah. But some of their formulas, I feel like, eh, they, mm -hmm. I've noticed that they're starting to get a little bit more geared towards marketing. Mm -hmm. And that they're not necessarily, I mean, some of them are therapeutic, but yeah. especially with yogi, I've seen them kind of yeah. shift a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah, but tra traditional medicinals is probably my favorite. Great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have a question that's what probably both of you can address. With the whole leaky gut, I mean, obviously there's varying levels of damage you can have to your gut. I'm assuming that's true. So, as far as like someone like me, I don't have any necessarily chronic issues that I'm noticing, but I can still work to heal my gut. So from a perspective as someone who's treating these people, how do you approach that, the whole leaky gut and gut health in general? If they're not complaining about it, are you like working to solve any problems? Does that make well, sense? So when I listen to someone's gut with my stethoscope before mm -hmm. I touch it, um, I can hear a lot. Um, how many times have you gone, I mean, I've never gone to like a regular provider and had a physical where they actually listened before they touched my gut. Mm -hmm. It's really important that we don't disturb the bowel sounds before we listen to them. So that's one thing I would say is like, I can, can tell you where stuff's stuck. I can tell you where there's hyperactivity or if there's absolutely nothing that's concerning too. Mm -hmm. You might have a blockage somewhere or just a Oh, so stagnant so just as easy. You can just kind of address it. Yeah, I can listen. But then also, um, you know, sometimes brain fog, sometimes skin, sometimes ADHD, sometimes like different signs of heavy metals or like sometimes I have clues and it's totally different symptoms than just indigestion. The person actually has, tells me they have no issues digesting. Uh -huh. um, and yeah, I'm just thinking chronic fatigue too. Yeah, there are other things. There's also a test I didn't mention when I was doing my part, but Gen Genova also offers a neutral nutri eval. Mm -hmm. so I'm gonna start doing those again, um, where I can get a breakdown of all of your amino acids and actually tell you what you're deficient in. Mm -hmm. Maybe not because you, maybe you're eating it, but maybe you're just not digesting it. Mm -hmm. So that's really helpful too. And then it would just be worked on with your digestion. So like for example, me with my mold illness, I like using myself because I, I gave myself permission to share. Um, but like my hands aren't as bad, but like they were really red and around my nails was super red from the vasculitis. Well, the vasculitis was coming from all the toxins from the mold. But like I didn't necessarily notice that until I went to another provider who looked at my body mm -hmm. and pointed it out. Because mm -hmm. it happened slowly over time. Yep. Um, 
so things like that. But I think in general, we have to work pretty proactively and pretty hard to keep our guts healthy mm -hmm. in this world because yes. of what we're being exposed to. Right. What do you think? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I again, I, bitters and carminatives. That's like yeah, kind of the thing not. that I think everyone that is and should be tea. doing, even if what was that? And metal tea. Yeah, I mean, to just you know, bitters before meals, a carminative tea after meals, and nettle tea once a day. Um, bitters are safe for bringing in breast No, no. Depends. Some of them are, but not always. Okay. Yeah. Is that like a label check thing, or do you need to do more research on that? A lot of I've noticed a lot of things that maybe say still say. Yeah, exactly. Your Some of them may be because it's stimulating. Mm -hmm. You don't want to stimulate like so much peristalsis that then the uterus is somehow getting affected by that. Mm -hmm. um, so certain bitters could be fine, but not all of them. So you wouldn't just want to get a bitters formula. Yeah, you you, mm -hmm. okay. yeah. And do you have experience, Rachel, with hyperemesis where pregnant women can't stop throwing up? Are there is there a whole different class of herbs that would actually help? No, I don't have experience with that. Because I know some midwives will say ginger. Yeah, ginger is the only thing that I really B know. B5. Yeah, um, that's interesting. <laughs> I had a friend who had that, and she was like planning a home birth, but it started pretty early for her, and she just totally went to medical. <coughs> and very best life for her. And I didn't know anything about it, so I was kind My of My suspicion is that it's actually an autoimmune condition mm -hmm. from what I've read, and that we don't know yet what to do about it. It's yeah. like triggered by pregnancy. Yeah. With the carminatives, do we break the rule of waiting two hours after a meal and just drink that tea? Yeah, with the carminative, I'd say wait 30 minutes mm -hmm. and then just drink a cup. And that, that's fine because it's going to be aiding in the digestion. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to, and if you've already, or you're waiting 30 minutes, then you're, you know, you're kind of moving on yeah. with the digestive process. Mm -hmm. And Rachel touched on this a lot, but I forgot to say it in my talk, which is, there's, we, we have something called the five R's of gut healing, or even this, I think it started as four, but we need to remove offending toxins or foods or things that are causing inflammation, um, begin to repair, so remove, repair, um, replace nutrients we're missing, and I forgot the fourth R. So there's five. Yeah, we, we recently <laughs> added a fifth in functional medicine. But, but the idea is that there's so many stages to this that that's why it's also really nice to work with a provider. Mm -hmm. um, anyway, I'll send that out when I send out the thing, just the five hours. The bitters take 15 minutes to 30 minutes before. Yeah, but you can all, like, that's kind of what you're supposed right to do, before. but I always take it right before. I mean, if you take it 15 to 30 minutes before, you'll notice that your body's starting to, okay, I'm getting hungry. Like you can actually feel mm -hmm. your stomach being, you know, so it's immediately then. Well, no, if you take it 15 to 30 minutes, then it's giving you that time to really get prepped to say, okay, my appetite's getting ready. You know, mm -hmm. that's ideal, but okay. I generally just do it right before because I'm in the kitchen. I'm like, oh, I'm about to eat. So, you know, whatever, again, like, that's probably ideal, 15 to 30 minutes before, but taking it right before really? is, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, if you do it 15 to 30 minutes, it's really, like, kind of giving you that time to, to get prepped before you're, like, bitters, food, you know, it gets, it gets the flow going a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah, um, we we are kind of out of time. I didn't talk about coffee at all too. I mentioned alcohol kind of uh, causing maybe gut. One of the problems with coffee is that it can contain a lot of mold toxins. Mold is like its own workshop too. But yeah, um, the other thing is that dehydration is just so common, and especially in the winter, I see more people oh, that are chronically yeah. dehydrated. Mm -hmm. You're sitting, and then you go to stand, and your pulse goes way up. You know you're dehydrated. So you can check your pulse and just kind of figure out if you're dehydrated. And then or if you pinch, isn't that if you if you turgor? Yeah. yeah. If it's if the skin it's sticks together, sticks you're dehydrated. Together. Yeah. Um, chemicals and coffee. Yeah, yeah. and even if you buy a mold-free, really safe coffee, um, I just see so many people that are drinking coffee constantly throughout the day. So everything in moderation. We talked about that last week. Over and over. Everything in moderation. I'm not saying that every single person has to avoid coffee, but Maybe just 
consider that it could be contributing and just experiment. It's your health. It's your body. Absolutely. What's the worst thing that could happen of taking it out for a week? I mean, for me, <laughs> caffeine in general, that puts me into a state of inflammation. I can't handle uh, particularly digestive inflammation. I can't even just one little cup of coffee. It's like, forget it. Then I, it's like, and I can feel it. So it's really, you know, person by person. Yeah. I mean, there's obviously, like you said, there's bigger issues involved with it, but yeah. Yeah. It's important to take the time to check in with how we feel, which yeah. is something we're not used to doing. So. Yeah, and I noticed that also caffeine, this is kind of like a sidebar, but it really aggravates my vagus nerve because depending on your nervous system and um, your constitution, I mean, caffeine, I will feel pain in my vagus nerve for days after caffeine sometimes, mm -hmm. and it kind of just depends on what's going on in my life in that moment. Like, oh, sometimes it didn't affect me, but it can really have some strong effects, mm -hmm. coffee or caffeine in general, mm -hmm. in the nervous system. Yeah. But that's another workshop. <laughs> yeah. yeah, seriously. Yeah. Delve into that all day. Thank you so much for yeah, thank coming. You. Thank you. Yeah. Every time we talk about herbs, I, I realize you need to go to school for herbs. <laughs> you shouldn't just grab a book. Oh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Nice. yeah. So we're lucky to have I know. I think that is, thank you. It's, it's definitely, you know, it does seem like, you know, it's a kind of a fine line between, you know, we want to empower people, but it's often better to be empowered by someone that's studied because a lot of people like to use herbs, but like mm -hmm. don't have the training in it. So they make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> yeah. We're going to upstairs, um, but feel free to hang out for a little while. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. I know, I know you can't talk, but you can hear us. We'll talk to you soon. So, up here.